Have all of you pooped yet? I hope so. Because where we're going, we're not going to make any stops. You and I are going to go on a trip together up here. <laughs> so, I'm in my car right now. Uh, I'm still a little sick. I'm still a little congested, but I can talk. And my energy is back, so... Yeah, um, I'm feeling better. Um, <clears throat> mm. The reason why I'm in my car right now is because my room is being used currently, so I figured I get enough peace and quiet in my car that I might as well make this video here. This is the video that I was talking about earlier in my sick video. I want to talk about a lot of things that has been on my mind, uh, different topics. And I originally was going to make all these into separate little videos, like, throughout next year. But, um, I don't think that would be a, an interesting thing to see on my channel. It's like, you know, so many different videos that a lot of people probably wouldn't even care about anyway. So I might as well get all the repetitive, boring stuff and smudge it into one long video, as opposed to, like, having that be all the content on my channel next year. That's boring. Um, so, yeah. This is going to be a pretty long video. So, uh, I might timestamp a couple of things, uh, in case you don't want to listen to me ramble on about everything. Maybe you can look in the description and see if there's a topic that you're interested in me talking about. I also wanted to make... A live stream of this stuff but apparently you need a thousand subscribers to do live streams so yeah considering I've been doing this for almost 10 years now and I only have like 350 subscribers um, I should have a thousand subscribers in like I don't know another another 20 years <laughs> I'll be like 50 years old maybe if I still make videos by then, but I probably won't, so. Yeah, this is the best I can offer people. You've probably already stopped watching the video by now, except for like maybe one or two people, so. If you're watching this, Captain Kirk, thank you. <laughs> and no one cares. Ah, uh, But I still want to talk about a few things that have been going on in my mind. In terms of video games or, uh plans or whatever. My windows are getting foggy. It's condensation, Johnny. First thing I want to talk about, I got a list here. Like two full pages stuff I want to talk about. So, yeah. I want to talk about how 2021 is the year of the remaster. You know how the Chinese have like their years? They got like the year of the rooster, the year of the snake, year of the dragon, whatever. Uh, this is like the year of the remaster in video games. Almost all the good games that came out this year are just remasters. Whether it's Hades that came out last year and it got reported onto, you know, PlayStation and Xbox, or Mass Effect, or Nier, or Nocturne, or Legend of Mana, which is kind of surprising since that was not that popular when it came out on PS1, but I personally liked it. You know, there are so many games that have come out aren't even 2021 games, they're remasters. And I don't want to say I'm getting sick of it, but I don't want this to turn into a thing where like, game developers are doing nothing but, like, making games they've already made, basically. It's kind of lazy. I want to see more original releases. But yeah, 2021 will forever be remembered, to me at least, as the year of the remaster. <coughs> Still getting over my sickness. I want to talk about how I rate games from 1 to 10 on my channel. When I review games, it's 1 to 10. Um, now, I used to do decimals, as in, like, 0.5s, until I started following the Metacritic user rule, where we can only rate 
you know, one to ten and nothing else. So I've just been doing, you know, one to ten. <laughs> just to make it my, my user thing the most accurate that I can to match my YouTube review scores, I guess. I don't play enough games to, like, have a point one decimal distinction. I would have to, like, play every game in the world. And that's physically impossible, okay? To play every single game that comes out. It's not possible. And even if it was physically possible, I would not financially go about that route. We just don't have the time. So, like, what's the difference between, like, a 9.2 and a 9.3? I mean, really. Come on. So, 0.5 is where I draw the line, you know, because if a game is, like, almost perfect or almost flawless, and there's a couple things that could have been better, it's a 9.5 or a 9 or whatever. I don't do 9.7852. Eight point seven five three oh nine. I do one to ten. Let's start off from the very bottom. A one. You're seeing this more often now than you have before. A one out of ten is when a game comes out and it's literally fucking unplayable. Or it's so bad or offensive. Or whatever that looks like completely repulsive like you will never want to play it um, a 1 out of 10 is like e football 2022 it literally came out unplayable broken or like the unpatched version of cyberpunk 2077 on ps4 like that's a one that shit is unplayable with the patches of course it, it, it catapults up to like a six or seven or whatever but when Cyberpunk came out on consoles, that shit was basically broken, right? A 2 out of 10 are games that are also nearly broken, still barely playable, but is so awful by design or whatever. Uh, games that are just not fun in the slightest. Games like Road Rage, I gave a 2 out of 10. Or uh, what else did I give a 2? I think I gave a 2 to, like, that Operation 7 free-to-play game that came out last year. I I don't even think it's online anymore. I, th I think they, they shut it down because uh, it fucking sucked. Yeah, that's a 2. And then a 3 is where we start getting playable but still really bad. Like, Fallout 76 is, is a 3 out of 10. Or, like, when No Man's Sky first came out, it was a 3 or... You know, 3 out of 10s are games that show little glimmers of goodness, but they just don't shine through the shit. They're just not games that are worth playing, but not unplayable. They're just really, really bad games. 4 out of 10 is where we start getting into the more mixed bag. It's still kind of bad, though. Games that are, like, really painfully disappointing. Or... Uh, just really dull altogether. 4 out of 10 are games that are like so bland or very uninspired or very contrived or very buggy as well. You know, if like if it had great potential but has really, you know, it's really buggy. Not not too much unplayable or broken or whatever, but it's not well put together. Like maybe like Crackdown 3 is a 4 out of 10. Or... um the Avengers or something. A lot of live service games, I would give like a fucking 4 out of 10. Like Battlefield 2042 is a 4 out of 10, right? You know, uh, missing features, it comes out incomplete. Bad in content or whatever, or could, you know, could get better, but 4 out of 10 is, again, not worth your money, but, you know, maybe it could be later on. 5 out of 10 is like pure mix. 5 out of 10 is like mediocre, or average at best, or games that have good ideas, but they don't exactly mend together, like that Battle Royale game I tried playing earlier this year, I forgot what it was called. Hunter's Arena, is that the name of it? 5 out of 10, you know, good ideas, bad ex execution type deal, like they're only halfway done, you know, like 12 minutes is a 5 out of 10, at best. That's, for me, that's probably closer to a 4, but... <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, that, that's probably like a 5 out of 10. 12 minutes, you know, very repetitive, not fun at all. Some good things here and there, like, you know, if it has good acting or whatever, but it's just not fun to play. Um, that's a 5 out of 10. Or if it's just boring, you know, like, like Bio Mutant I heard wasn't that good. That's probably a 5 out of 10, right? Or, you know, games that don't have good ideas and then suffer from those bad ideas like Shenmue 3. <laughs> it's not unplayable, you know, it, it's not even like buggy. It's just, it's just not well thought out. That's like a 5 out of 10. I know I gave it a 7 in my review for that game. It did not deserve a 7. It deserved closer to a 5. Uh, Shenmue 3. 6 out of 10 is okay. It's like tolerable, but still kind of disappointing. Again, more generic and uninspired, but at the same time, a little more tolerable. You know, a 6 out of 10 would be kind of like the average Assassin's Creed game. <laughs> like, I'd probably give, like, most, uh, or at least most of the newer Assassin's Creed games, like a 6. You know, they're, they're kind of just generic and more of the same that starts getting um, old. You know, like Call of Duty, the new ones will probably be like a six for me. They still work, you know, they're still fine, but they're just, uh, they're just okay, you know? Now, a seven out of 10 is where we start getting a little positive. Games that have flaws, but are otherwise pretty good, Overall, a lot of games that come out on Game Pass are like sevens to me. You know, they're they're serviceable and they're they're fairly good. There's some fun to be had. Uh, they may be buggy, but you know they're they're okay. Uh, seven, seven out of ten is like flawed, but still pretty fun and kind of worth it. Eight out of ten is when I start recommending games. Eight out of ten. Eight is great. And I don't mean that to rhyme. Eight is great. Not amazing. Probably not game of the year quality, but great. Overall, solid games, if not groundbreaking. They're still very enjoyable. They, you know, like uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, which I just recently played through a couple weeks ago. That was a great game. It's not game of the year, but it's a great game, and I do recommend it. You know what I mean? Games that are overall satisfying throughout even though they have a few problems here and there. A 9 out of 10 is very high quality games. Games that I absolutely recommend, even if they're not flawless or, or they're not masterpieces or they don't break new ground, but they're so good. Like Psychonauts 2, I gave a 9. And it's a really high quality style platformer with, you know, good story, good characters, pretty much good all around, but there are a couple flaws like camera problems and, you know, a couple cheap places here and there in design, but still really exceptional. Or Resident Evil Village, I also gave a 9. Really good quality action slash survival horror. You know, it gets the job done really well. It has a good balance of gameplay. Uh, has a good story. 9 out of 10 is like very well-rounded games, even if they have a couple flaws. They're better than great. They're amazing. But they, you know, they're not quite nearly as amazing as they could be. And that leaves us to 10. I rarely give 10s to games, and for good reason. 10s are games that leave like a permanent lasting impression on my life as a gamer. Games that are like the best of their genre, basically, or kind of like invent genres almost. They're very pioneering games. Games like Spiritfarer. I've never played anything remotely like Spiritfarer. That game is a 10 because it, it pushed boundaries of emotion in a way that I feel like could only be replicated in a video game. It's crazy. They have, like, the story linked to the gameplay itself. Uh, I think Bioshock, the original Bioshock, is another example of a 10. Now, for me, 
Games don't have to be perfect to get 10s out of 10s even. They can have a couple problems here and there. You know, nitpickings or whatever. But they can still be 10 out of 10s. If they revolutionize a genre of, or, of, or you know, of some kind. Um, or they do something really new that we've never seen before in a video game. And not only that, but it does it right. I, I gotta clarify on that. Sometimes a game does have a uniqueness to it, but not all unique games are unique in a good way. Like, Death Stranding probably isn't unique in a good way, right? Um, there are games that have very evolutionary uh, gameplay or designs or whatever. Hades is another good example. I love Hades so much. It's the best roguelike game I've ever played. It, it's the best of its genre, really. And I think most people who are fans of roguelikes, which I'm not even a fan of roguelikes, and, and Hades is like one of my all-time favorite games now, they'll agree that Hades is probably the best roguelike game to date. That's a 10 out of 10. Yeah, I rarely give out 10s. You know, sometimes I'll give a remaster a 10, like Hades. I haven't tried Mass Effect yet, but... Uh, I don't know, I feel like overall, as a series, Mass Effect is like a 9, if you don't include Mass Effect Andromeda. I'm just talking about the, the three games kind of like average out to a 9, right? That's how I rate games from 1 to 10. There's a lot of varying degrees, but I feel like that's the most simple way to put it, even though I spent like 12 minutes talking about it, or 10 minutes, or whatever. Anyway... On to the next topic, finally. If you're wondering why it's starting to get dark outside, I'm currently recording this at like 4 p.m. or 4.30 p.m., so uh, don't be surprised if like it's like complete pitch black outside by the time we're done with this video. Top 5 games I fail to review. I've played a lot of games at launch that for one reason or another, I couldn't review games that i failed to review not necessarily uh games that i didn't want to review or i got later on in the year these are like games that i pretty much played at launch that for some reason or, or whatever i didn't get around to reviewing it the number five on my list is ori and the will of the wisps I'm not sure what I was doing when it came out, but I think at the time that it came out, I might have been finishing The Blind Forest, the first Ori game, and then moving on to Ori and the Will of the Wisps. But I, I regret not reviewing it still. Even if I was like a couple weeks late, I could have put out a, a review for it. I'm not sure what else I was playing on Game Pass, but I don't know. I could have at least had like a Game Pass review then. You know, and add that into whatever else I was playing on Xbox Game Pass. And that was a really, really great uh, 2D Metroidvania-style game. Probably even better than The Blind Forest. So, yeah. Number four, Cyberpunk 2077. When I, when I say, okay, when I say top, I don't mean top best games I fail to review. I mean, like, top notable games that I failed to review, okay? That's why Cyberpunk is on here. Um, not because it's among the best, but because it is among the most notable to come out, or infamous, or whatever. Whatever word you want to describe it. Cyberpunk 2077, I played through it at launch. It took me a while, and that's because of how buggy it was, on PS4 at least. Almost all my captures of that shit was bug related stuff like instead of doing a review it li literally would have just been another bug compilation that everyone else put out because that's like all you could put out at the time for cyberpunk is bug compilations and i'm like i can't use this shit for my review you know like i can hardly do fucking anything without triggering a bug or an ait pose it was so awful <clears throat> that i just couldn't give like a full review i gave like a thoughts on it while the credits were rolling and the game actually fucking crashed on me live while i was doing a thoughts review while i was doing the credits i'm like oh my god dude cyberpunk 2077 was unreviewable in video form 
I was able to write a review on Metacritic. I think I gave it a 6. That was very generous of me, you know, because I knew it would kind of get fixed over time. And I did like the story, you know, and I did kind of like some aspects of leveling up. And, you know, it had a, a good mixture of gameplay, like stealth and hacking and combat. You know, I mean, it, it had the variety. It was just so poorly put together. I don't think there's a source code for that game. I really do not. How could there be a source code for a game that was that badly put together without the patches? Like, really? Like, it, it it's like metaphorically filled with bullet holes. The source code must be, like, fucking useless. Um, it was so bad when that game came out on a technical sense. It was so bad. Now, my number three is a game that's like the complete opposite of Cyberpunk 2077, and that was Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. This game took me forever because of how fucking hard it was when I played through it for the first time. It took me like a month. I thought it was a month because like when I did my first impressions of it and I gave it like an 8 in good faith because it's a from software game and their games are usually typically at least 8 out of 10s. I was just frustrated with it at first, you know, and... <sighs> I remember saying that in my first impressions, I said that I was going to move on because I did have other games that I wanted to get to, and I just didn't want to commit. I told my I told myself and to you that I didn't want to commit to, you know, doing nothing but trying to play a game that punishes you for, like, the, the tiniest stuff. And what did I do? What did I do right after making that video? I went back to Sekiro and kept playing it and playing it until like at least three weeks later I showed a video of my cowardly ass getting through the last boss. Like it took me that long to get to I, I, I don't know I don't know where I was I think I was like stuck in the raging bull or something like really early on like like I I it was either the Raging Bull or Genichiro, one of those two, but yeah, I, it took me so long, it took me so long to beat that game that by the time I beat it, I, I just didn't want to review it, you know, because I had already like spent so much time thinking about Sekiro, you know, in my mind that, you know, I just, I just wanted to move on. Uh, it was a really great game, though. Really great action game. Uh, really amazing combat system. Pretty emotional story, too, if you think about it, or if you have played it. But I actually played through it multiple times, and I got the Platinum Trophy. I, I actually started to get kind of obsessed with it, with it and completing it and beating all the, the mini-bosses and stuff. And uh, it was great, you know? Top five, you know, best games of the year of you know, 2019 or whatever. Really, really great action game. But it was so fucking hard that I, I just, I didn't have the energy to review it. By the time I was done, I was exhausted. I was like, oh my God. Holy shit. Ugh. Number two is Red Dead Redemption 2. I'm not sure that... This was another game that took me a long time to finish. Not because it was really hard. It was kind of hard, but not, like, unforgiving. It was, uh, it was just really, really, really long. It took me a long time to beat it, and I think it was just one of those games that was so long and so huge and so detailed that giving out a full review probably... I probably wouldn't have had it out until, like, mid-December. <laughs> I was probably just <laughs> playing something else, like, right after finishing Red Dead uh, 2 and the GTA Online. Not GTA Online. Red Dead Online. That I just had to move on. And my number one is God of War 2018. The most notable game. I think I mentioned it. And I, I mentioned how much I loved it. By the time I had beaten it, uh, it did become my 2018 game of the year. But I think the reason why I didn't review it was because at the time, the computer that I was using was getting all messed up. It might have had a virus in it, 
And that was before I bought my new computer that I have now. So my computer for editing was getting all fucked. I, I, I couldn't edit together a review, basically. So as much as I loved the hell out of that game, I just couldn't make a, an actual review. I just had to do a mini review. So, yeah. So those are the top five games I failed to review. Now, I have another top five that I want to talk about. Top five things I hate about modern gaming. I don't think I want to get into detail that much. I just want to give them out to you. My number five is too much similarities in games, not enough variety. So basically, in a nutshell, what that means is not enough innovation in new games these days. It's just more of the same stuff. Like, a lot of open-world games where, you, where all you do is just go around collecting shit or, you know, first-person shooter after first-person shooter. There's way too many first-person shooters. There's way too many multiplayer shooters. There's way too many Battle Royale games. It is driving me insane. I don't understand the, the appeal, you know? Like... Like, you, you've already played Fortnite and PUBG and Apex. Like, why are we still making Battle Royale games, man? I mean, why? They're getting old. They, they are old. And, like, the genre itself isn't even that old. <laughs> it's, the genre itself is, like, what, like, five years old? When did, when did PUBG come out? 2017? Four years? So many Battle Royale games in such a short amount of time, man. Holy crap. But yeah, that's number five. Number four, microtransactions. Basically simulated gambling. You know, like paying money for cosmetics when they should be unlocked by earning them in-game. I miss the old days where, you, where you, you unlock stuff just by playing through the game on like the hardest difficulty or something. Not fucking DLCs and season passes and microtransactions, you know? Number three, digital-only distribution. Now, I do understand that there are perks to having digital-only games. But the more I see companies and uh, services being shut down, the more I realize that digital ownership is basically just rentals. You don't actually own the game. Actually, nowadays, even physical games... They don't come with the data on the disc. Like, you basically still have to download all the information on the disc. So, it's the whole digital thing is, in my eyes at least, rental ownership. Like, what happens if something if something happens to, like, my account? It gets hacked or I lose my account or whatever. I lose all those games that are associated with my account that I bought. You lose access to them. But look at the Wii, the original Wii in the Virtual Console. You know, like, he, like I remember not even having an account to download, to buy and download games. But that just made it even worse. Because basically, if something happened to your console, that's it. Um, so yeah, man, I'm still leaning more towards the physical side of, of games. And unfortunately, they are kind of going away. And that sucks. I love physical media. And I do understand that there are, are ways that physical media can be a letdown. Like if, if someone steals your copy or it gets burned in a fire or whatever. I mentioned that before in my, my older video, the physical versus digital. But still, <clears throat> I don't like the idea of a digital-only future for games. I just don't. Okay? Number two, software updates. The whole release a game broken, fix later, oh, and give us money up front. Oh, and we're, we're, you're going to pay us to test our games. Assholes. They should be paying us. We should be getting paid. Not, the, not, not paying them. I mean, almost all games nowadays comes out like early access. Early access is just a fancy way of saying... Uh, you're testing our games, and we're, we're gonna, we're gonna take your feedback and fix them, eventually. Maybe never, because we're lazy. Lazy developers that, that, uh, put out unfinished broken games, and they expect us to help them fix it. Because they're too fucking lazy to, to test their games. So, yeah, constant updates, come on, man, come on, man, 
man. All of a sudden, my accent becomes Jamaican. Come on, man. Number one, live service shit. Live service games. These are games that are not going to exist forever. These are games that when companies give up or they stop, you know, making new content for those games, they're going to go away. They'll be a thing of the past, literally. Like, Destiny will probably one day be shut down forever. Outriders, shut down forever. The Division, shut down forever. There's so many live service games. Battlefield 2042. Ten years from now, it'll probably be shut down forever. Why? <laughs> Why? Why use all that money? For games that probably aren't even going to exist because they're live service. Online only. All servers shut down eventually, right? So yeah, those are our top five things I hate about modern gaming. On to the next page. We're probably not even halfway done here. Holy crap, this is going to be like an hour long thing. Top five YouTubers that I'm inspired by. Number five, Mega64. Mega64, they're, at least nowadays, they're known for their podcasts, but back in the day, they used to make, maybe they still kind of do, but not as frequently, they make, like, really funny outdoor skits, like, in public. Now, I don't do that stuff in public, but, like, I feel like their humor and their their skits are kind of what, like, influenced me a little bit in my outdoor skits that I used to do with Zach and, you know, stuff like that. Number four, Pro Jared. Um, I feel like some, some of my commentary is kind of influenced by Pro Jared in my reviews or whatever. Number three, Angry Joe. Angry Joe has a strong influence on my, uh, my review, uh, my, my criticism for games in terms of... Re we we kind of have, like, the same opinions about like where gaming is going we have the same criticisms like 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 in my top my top five modern gaming things i hate I guarantee you those are things that angry joe hates too we we kind of have very similar thoughts in terms of like when we re like how we review games we don't exactly have the same like opinions on specific games i tend to agree with uh, to agree with him i tend to disagree with him but he's still an influence on my creativity as a reviewer. Number two is Angry Video Game Nerd. Angry Video Game Nerd is probably like the number one who inspired me to be funny on YouTube because he was so goddamn funny that like his videos are like the, the things that like give me the most enjoyment out of my life. Like I love watching not so much his newer episodes but like his really old episodes were just so fucking funny and just so creative and uh i love cinemassacre as a whole i love angry video game nerd i love board james you know um mike and james monday plays or whatever that's called you know and he seems like a really nice guy too um so if you're watching this james uh you're a god you're a legend and I'll always respect you, no matter where you go in life. He's definitely the number one in terms of just, like, comedic content and uh, stuff like that. Like, kind of toilet humor, but I kind of do some toilet humor myself in my videos. So, yeah. Number two. Now, number one. This is a, <laughs> this is a, a YouTuber who's not even that big. Well, he's obviously bigger than me, but he doesn't have, like hundreds of thousands of subscribers. I think he only has like 20,000. Uh, it's Steve Benway. Steve Benway was basically the YouTuber that inspired me to start my channel, pretty much. He does a lot of uh, gameplay recordings, like live. Like he used to like set up his, uh, his camcorder in front of his TV and record games that he's playing. And nowadays he, he does use a capture card and face cam and all that stuff, but Back in the day, uh, he was a lot like me when I first started out, you know, when I had, I didn't even have a way to, like, capture video, so I just, like, recorded, you know, my TV screen, and it used to turn out like shit, 
But um, yeah, he was like the main reason why I started my YouTube channel in the first place is because I was fascinated by the simplicity of his content. And, you know, it was good content and I just liked it. Plus, he's English, so he has like this really, this really relaxing English accent. So I, I, I just, I, I loved watching Steve Benway's and I, I kind of just wanted to start, you know, my own thing like that. And then, you know, I, I, I started my, my influence from Angry Video Game Nerd kind of combined with that. And I started making like funny Let's Plays. You know what I mean? So yeah, those are the top five YouTubers I'm inspired by. We're all done with my top five, so hopefully uh, these last few things will... Uh, yep, it's, all, it's nighttime out now already. Hopefully these, these remaining topics will go by faster. Why I will never monetize my channel. It's simple. One, I thrive for total creative control on my channel. So I don't want anyone telling me what I can and can't post on my own my own YouTube channel. I don't like people telling me what I can and can't have in my videos. So that's one. That, that, I, I don't want partnership. Uh, and part of the reason why people have sponsors is because... They have to sponsor companies within their videos and like and like advertise them and like I'm not interested in that shit. I mean, like fucking uh, like even Angry Joe, you know. I mean he he's got a million subscribers and that's another reason I'll get to that later. He's got like you know three or four million subscribers. He, he makes a ton of views and so he sponsors like Manscaped or that that wallet company or whatever in his videos. Or, or Pro Jared does with Magic Spoon or or those earbuds, you know? Or Angry Video Game Nerd, ExpressVPN, you know? They have sponsors in their videos, and it lengthens their videos so that you kind of have to, like, sit through or, or try to figure out when the actual video starts or... Uh, all these reasons are very inconvenient to the audience, and that's the most important thing to me is you guys, the audience. I don't care if I'm not making any money, as long as it is something that's good to watch for you guys, you know? And another thing, even if I wasn't like this, I still wouldn't be making dollars. Like, I'd, I'd be making, like, a, like nickels at best, pennies, okay, if, if my videos were monetized, because I'm not a popular YouTube channel, and I never will be, most likely, so, you know, my videos only make, like, 30 or 40 views on average, and, um, that's not even enough to make a penny, I don't think, so it's pointless, unless, of course, you know, again, partnership, they'll promote me, you know, and they'll, they'll kind of like, um, they'll spread word of mouth basically for me, but still, I, I just don't want partnership, you know? So yeah, th those are the reasons why I don't like monetizing my channel. It's funny because I think there actually is a video of mine that is monetized, or at least has ad placements. It's one of my Sony related videos that came out earlier this year. For some reason has an ad in it, and I don't know why. I uh, Trust me, I did not authorize ads for that video, so if you're wondering, I, I, I my guess is as good as yours. Why I quit Facebook and haven't looked back. This is more of a, a personal a personal reason as opposed to a YouTube reason. It, it has nothing to do with YouTube. I just um Facebook has become a pool of toxicity, or at least it was when I when I left uh, earlier in February. It's just become very aggressively political and just really toxic and keyboard warrior -y. and to be fair YouTube has unfortunately kind of is kind of going in that field and uh I'm trying to distance myself from that because it, it's not healthy Facebook is not healthy for me you know maybe in a couple of years I might go back on it once in a while but for now in this stage in my life I really don't need it and, you know, I've been happier without Facebook than I ever was with it. So that should be telling you something. 
once in a while, I do miss posting, like, funny things, because, like, I, I got Facebook friends who don't watch my channel, so being able to post, like, the funnier clips of my videos on Facebook and having them watch it, I do miss that one part about Facebook, is, is the, the connection that I had with people. But yeah, aside from that, I don't miss Facebook. I really don't. You know, I, I don't need it. It's it's toxic and it's toxic. That's all there is to it. Like that that that's the only word I need to say. Toxic. And they they changed the company name to Meta too or something stupid. Like, come on, man. <laughs> People aren't gonna spend fifteen years using Facebook just to call it something else, you know? Is realism ruining certain games or modern games? Yes and no for me. Um, sometimes uh, when I play a game or if I play like a survival game that is meant to be a survival game, like The Long Dark, I do appreciate that part of survival. Like, I, I look for survival games, but I don't want every game to be a survival game. And I, I feel like a lot of games these days are, like, implementing survival features like hunger and th thirst or whatever in games that don't really need it. Like, Red Dead Redemption 2, as much as I really like that game, the survival elements seemed a little forced. I feel like the, the whole realism is kind of, like, seeping its way into games that probably shouldn't have them. But there are obviously games that that uh, that they're made for, like Kingdom Come Deliverance was like a medieval survival simulator. It fit that because that's what it was. But games that are meant to be like action adventures or open world mystery adventures or something probably shouldn't have <laughs> realistic survival issues. You know what I mean? Like so. That's something that once in a while I think about. Like, I'll, I'll play a game that, like, I didn't know would have survival elements, and they do have survival elements, and I'm like, oh, well, I, I didn't know. I probably wouldn't have gotten it then. Um, yeah. How I feel about certain accessibility features in games. A good example of accessibility are games that have, like, closed captioning for deaf people, like, um... Well, well, basically any game that has subtitles. But um, also, you know, games that have really adaptive difficulties. Like, uh, I think Hades is actually a prime example of uh, accessible difficulty. Like, if it's too hard, and it is pretty hard, you can activate God Mode. It's a mechanic, but it's not like a cheat. It's not like you're invincible. Basically, it starts off like you get 20% damage reduction, and every time you die, it, it increases by, like, 2%, and it goes, it goes that way until it, like, caps out at, like, 80%. So, you know, I mean, that's a good example of, like, accessibility features, is that if you're not good enough at a game or something, and it kind of, like, helps you, like, a, it's like training wheels of, like, helping you get better at the combat in that game, and then when you're ready to, like, take the game on when you feel ready, you can disable that mechanic and, like, play it for real. Uh, that's a really good example of accessibility. Things I'm not okay with are basically cheats that masquerade as accessibility features. Like, in Psychonauts 2, there's an option to enable invincibility so that you can you can literally cheat through the entire game, and that's not okay with me. It spoils the, the whole game, you know? Again, okay in, like, cheat codes, like, back in the day when they had cheat codes and stuff, but nowadays, like, in it, if you're able to do that and, like, still unlock everything, that's not really okay, you know? For the rest of the people who, like, want to play it for real, I play it for real, and I suck at platformers. I mean, it wasn't, like, a really hard game or anything, but still, like, it's not my expertise, and I, I played through it just fine, you know? So, and also, I think, like, Dodgeball Academia had, like, an, it had, I mean, that had a, a good difficulty, uh, meter, where you could, like, set it from, like, you know, 200% damage all the way down to 0% damage, 
but the fact that you can go all the way down to 0% damage and literally breeze through the whole game and and be awarded as much as people who played through it normally, I'm not okay with that either. So, yeah, I, I like the idea of accessibility, but sometimes I feel like it's not implemented correctly. That's my uh, my opinion on accessibility. It It does vary between games. Much like realism. Who would you choose to save you in a video game? <laughs> Depending, I guess that depends on the, the type of situation that you're in. Like if you're in like a hostage situation, you're being held hostage. You'd probably want someone who is good at infiltration. Like uh, like maybe like Captain Price from Call of Duty or like Max Payne or something. I feel like overall though, you want like the strongest man in any video game or... Someone who is like so unfazed, like like Doom Guy, or Kratos maybe, but at the same time, those don't particularly seem like two characters who would give a shit about your safety. Like they probably wouldn't want to protect you. You know what I mean? Like they're they're the most powerful characters in all the video games, but I'm not sure that they would care about saving one person. In any given situation. Well, I would say that if you had the power to summon a character, like, like a slave, then I would probably choose like Kratos. Summon, summon the spirit of Kratos to save me. Yeah. Did I tell you how weird some of these topics were in my head? They sound even weirder coming out. Who would you summon to save you in a video game? And my last question is is gaming becoming a luxury hobby i think so especially with scalpers out and about you know they buy ps5s and then they they resell them for like thousands of dollars so yeah i i think it has become a bit of a luxury and also of course there's a mass production of video games you know when when you combine new games with remasters like there's game releases coming out every single day of each year that like it has becoming it's becoming a luxury and also games are getting more and more expensive you can argue that's just inflation but still like it seems like just yesterday to me that games were 60 or becoming 60 back in like 2006 and stuff and now 15 years later it's already 70 dollars for, you know, new PS5 and Series X games. Maybe not Series X games, but definitely PS5 games are $70. And, um, yeah. I think it's becoming a luxury, personally. And I, I feel like I, I just gotta stop. Or maybe not stop, but slow down on my video game purchases. Because I have a ton of video games that I haven't even played yet. So, that's it. The video is over. Are you still awake? I hope so. It's nighttime now. All right, I gotta shut off my car's lights because it's it's draining the battery, and uh, I don't want to have to jump start my car again. Last time I did, I forgot to turn off my headlights. <laughs> Thank you for watching. The Gamer Gods.